I want to talk about the initial conversations that Kathy, Larry, JJ, and you had, not about story, but about feeling, about imagery, and about where those images were going to get you to feeling. In other words, did you start your writing process not focusing on characters, but what that story would mean to audience in terms of emotion? I think it is about feeling, you know, feeling, trying to recapture feeling, the, 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 uh, a new hope gave to people, you know, a, a new hope maybe. Um, and they were so delightful, so uh, elating, you know, so stirring and surprising and funny and, and um, you know, just, uh, the, I think people walked out with their heads spinning in 1977 and we were trying to think like, that that's what happened to us, how could we make that happen for people today, is it possible? And you know, you can never be the original again, but what you can do is you can try to get at those feelings, try to create images that excited people in that way, and work variations on them. Because at times have changed, the technology has changed, we have a new generation of actors in the movie, everything is different and everything's the same. And, and we wanted to get that feeling of like, oh, people could be happy walking out of here. At the heart, of, of, of Star Wars, it, and you can describe it in all sorts of different ways, but it's all the same thing, I think. Um, it's, it's humor, uh, it's humanity, it's uh, vitality, it's the force, and it's this <laughs> idea of, 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 a, of vital power. And to me, as, as, even as, as at, a, at 10 years old, when I first saw Star Wars, the, the spectacle and the adventure and the, the romance, all that stuff was undeniable, the music, the sound effects. The, George Lucas did the impossible. He did everything right. And, uh, it, but for me, the number one thing on that list was the humor. And, and it was that amazing sense of humor uh, that, that made you want to be with those people. And, and, and so when we started talking about it from the very beginning, before I even met with, with Larry, when Kathy and I first talked, that idea of of trying to make this thing feel authentic mm -hmm. uh, and and making it funny uh, were two of the things we talked about at the very beginning. And, and the authenticity part was partly about going on locations and building sets and having as much practical stuff. But the humor element for me is that thing I thought, oh my God, to be able to get that feeling again, it's, it's what you were talking about, uh, would, would be the, the dream if we could. And how did you and Harrison have conversations about that, about that character and about what was funny to Han and what was funny to Harrison? He never spoke to me. <laughs> <clears throat> I, had, I had the best time, I think, <laughs> an impossibly great time. And, and the reason I had a, a great time is because there was no burden on me. There was, the leadership of this thing was so strong, so clear. The intentions were so, so clear. Uh, to me, that it left me as an actor with nothing to do but um, show up and say the words. We, you could grunt and shrug, and uh, and I would have got what you what you <laughs> what you wanted. But I felt wonderfully uh, comfortable and directed, and I mean that in the in the best possible way. I, as I say, I, the intention was clear from the script. But every day was uh, a ball to go to work, and uh, that doesn't happen every time. I also just need to say that one of the ama amazing things, uh, watching these new young actors, uh, who have never, in the case of Daisy Ridley, been in a film, uh, or John Boyega, who had uh, really only done a couple of little things, uh, I say little comparatively because this movie was so ridiculously huge to, to work on, but your generosity uh, to them and, and, and helping them, building them up and doing every off-camera thing as much as you, I mean, it, it was, it, what was, my favorite thing about it wasn't just that the movie was benefiting, which it was, but I was watching these young actors see what it's like to be gracious. And that was one of those things you just know they're gonna carry that on, and it was invaluable. We were going to school on Star Wars. We knew that we needed to immerse ourselves in a world that George had created. But as JJ was saying, Larry was saying at the same time, we were moving it 
ahead into the future. But we had to understand the basic premise, look, feel, whatever it was that would start to make us all find that intuitive sense of recognizing what was in fact Star Wars and what wasn't. And it's funny because we get asked this all the time, well, how did you know? And it is this feeling that you develop after a while when you start to get a, re a deeper understanding of where Ralph McQuarrie and some of the early designers came up with the, with the look of Star Wars, which I have to say, every time we would go back to Ralph McQuarrie's artwork, <laughs> it was just incredible yeah. what, he, what he created. One of the conversation, it, it was just a conversation about what would actually frighten you if the dark side would sort of reemerge, and that was before we thought about awakening, but just the idea that it would come back. And it was actually Dennis Murin who thought, well, what if you could take the light out of the sky? That's darkness. And it was one of those things that it was a vision without an image. And then as we tried to make that into something that we could work with, JJ said, and then we could turn that into a weapon. So each, at each step, it would become more, or, or the, the idea of a Nuremberg-esque rally that's not really just a rally, it, it leads to something that's really um, serious. And so the funny thing is that the movie's pretty serious. Very on, after I started working on it, I had this image in my head of uh, like a knight in shining armor, but inspired by a stormtrooper. And uh, we had been working pretty, pretty long days just, just uh, trying to, to solve the, uh, the, the uh, costume of Kylo Ren. And I just thought maybe there was something in it, like, like he was the lord of the uh, stormtroopers. And uh, uh, I didn't want to make a silver stormtrooper, but, uh, but armor that, that uh, looked, resembled a stormtrooper. And uh, we had this amazing uh, concept artist named uh, Dermot Power, who I asked, I told him my, my, the thoughts that were in my head, the images, and he did this amazing illustration, very powerful. J.J. loved it, but he, uh, he immediately said, this is, this is not Kylo Ren, this is, is not something that uh, solves the problems, and uh, you know, I love the drawing, but it doesn't work. Shortly after that, Kathy came uh, into uh, our design room and saw this image hanging on the wall and said, you know, that's amazing, what is that? I think after Kathy's reaction, J.J. created uh, the part of uh, Phasma, uh, but then he, he in his brilliance, um, cast uh, Gwendolyn uh, Christie, uh, which, which I thought was such an amazing idea. And um, I think the difference between Star Wars then and now, uh, when that happened, there was no thought in my mind to kind of change the design for a woman. I mean, this was the character, this was the design, this was something that we all loved. And, uh, you know, Gwendolyn wore it beautifully. And uh, I don't think that would have happened uh, in, in uh, the 70s. The idea that the early movies represented this very tangible reality that you could some, you know, you could visit these places. They went to Tunisia, you know, they weren't inventing planets in a, in a weird way. Everything seemed relatively um, familiar to you. So that was the sort of the underlying foundation for us, that we just wanted to take that idea that one step further. And, and how, do you, how do you do that? Well, you might say, well, you would use miniatures or whatever, you know, to do that kind of thing. Well, the truth is that the technology available to us today is just so ridiculously advanced that you, you know, you kind of do the polar opposite. You, you, you try and build up this sort of technology to a place where you can actually render a desert or create a forest or build an ice planet and then literally that frees you up to then just concentrate on you know trying to get the best shots into the movie and and part of that again is is you know there is in the very business that I work in this idea that sometimes more is more and more is better and the truth is you know sh sometimes you they had to show a degree of restraint in 1977 and 1982 you know that's part of the the landscape but what we wanted to do was show that restraint again and, and make sure that the audience felt focused on what they were really watching and the, and the notion that they, it wasn't just being overwhelmed by the surroundings or the planet or what was going on. And of course, you know, you want it to be exciting, 
and you want it to have all of that, but the feeling of, of that you were immersed in this movie and these v events were really happening. People were running to the Millennium Falcon and it was gonna take off. And I thought if we could, you know, obviously that was the goal, was just trying to do that and trying to make that happen and make you really believe that those things were happening. What, can I just say one thing? That, that, that when I saw the, the Star Wars for the first time, and it, it was so mind-blowing because it, it just did look real. And for some reason, one of the things that, that just struck me so hard was that uh, the, the sand crawler, you know, and not knowing how the hell they did it. Like, what was real, what wasn't, because those giant treads were right there, and you just couldn't tell. And it seemed like up till that point, any one of us could go, that's a miniature, that's a map painting, I know, you know. And somehow Star Wars just blew all that away, and just wiped the table clean and said, we're starting over. And we're not gonna let you have see the seams, we're not gonna let you understand, give you a hint of how it was done. And what was cool about this, we had at our uh, fingertips sort of every available resource. But the question was, well, what would they have done and how can we approach this, not just grab the most obvious thing, but you know, do creatures that are, are being built and made, build more sets where possible, but what Roger and his team have done uh, on this, and I think better than I've ever seen, is the same thing that I was just talking about, which is I don't think you know where things ended, what was real, what wasn't. I mean, when that giant creature that John Boyega is drinking water out of the trough next to, that was there. Those were five guys in a big suit uh, in 130 degree heat in Abu Dhabi. And, and started with five, ended with three. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, the creature just started to collapse. <laughs> it's like, what's going on? Um, and and they paint out their legs. But then there are other pieces where you know when you see the castle battle, we had a fairly enormous set there, but it was on the back lot of Pinewood, and there was no water there. There was you know it was a piece of the set, and Roger and his team didn't just do all the uh, the aerial stuff, but also extended the set in a way. You know, in in the Maz Kanata sequence when you first meet Maz. You know, every creature in that room was practical, every single one except for Maz. And it, it was that kind of thing where you just, you don't quite know where things are real, where things aren't. And it was exactly that feeling uh, that, that we all had when we saw the, the first movie. And it's, it's a testament yeah. to what and you Yeah, and I think the other, the other word that I kept on coming back to is charm, you know. And that's, uh, I, I think as human beings, you instantly relate to, you know, uh, that notion if you've, you know, if you have children, you grab their soft toy or whatever and you wobble it around and put on a funny voice. There's this sort of inherent charm to all of these things and, and you can tell stories in a very, very simple way by doing that kind of stuff and obviously we weren't quite doing that but we were doing the very expensive advanced version of that and you know, you, you want to have that charm and sometimes I think the digital world sort of lacks some of that and it, it you know, it, when, we, when we worked with Mars and you know, Uncle and all the other characters we did for the movie, you, you want that kind of quality. And part of that was working so closely with Neil. And I would say, for example, BB-8, you know, I can't tell you sometimes which shots are digital and which shots aren't, you know, because the fact that we built the character, and if you define BB-8, and the fun of that was that he was acted by the puppeteers most of the time. And that means that the actors actually understand his personality. And often what happens in the, in the visual effects world is, you know, everyone's pretending there's a character there, but the character hasn't truly been defined by something or somebody or whatever the process is. And we did everything we could where Mars was involved, that we had the actor there saying her lines. When we did BB-8, even if we couldn't actually do the action with the character, he would be acted out by the puppeteers. So it's just this incredible sort of sense of embodying these characters with real feeling and with real personality. Frank Oz saw the movie, who's Yoda, obviously, saw the movie uh, at the premiere. And he came running over and, and grabbed me. And he was so excited because Neil Scanlon, who we had literally brought out of retirement to do this movie, he was retiring at a fairly young age because he assumed that this kind of craft and technology just wasn't going to be needed anymore, that everybody was moving toward uh, CG characters and the art of puppeteering and what they had done, what the Hensons have done and, and certainly what had gone on in Star Wars was no longer needed. And I think that was one of the things that we were really struck by is that when we brought Neil into this process and then all the people who came out of the woodwork 
who are just exceptional at what they do. And they came into this with such um, pride and enthusiasm and um, they just did incredible work. I, every single day we would go into the, to the creature shop and just be astounded by the work that was going on. So in a sense, I think what was really exciting to all of us is that we rejuvenated this whole side of the industry that thought they were obsolete, which was really exciting.